Do you want to make money breeding sheep and ensure a successful lambing season? Here at Heifer USA, we've been raising sheep for over 30 years, and now we're teaching you how to double your sheep flock and increase profits with a successful breeding operation. In this video, sheep expert Christine Hernandez will discuss the breeding process, pregnancy care and ultrasounds, field processing newborn lambs, maintaining thorough records, and most importantly, how much money you can make from breeding, raising, and selling sheep for meat. Stay tuned until the end of this video to find out how we made more than $25,000 in one year of sheep production. Hey, I'm Christine Hernandez, and I'm the Livestock Specialist here at Heifer USA. I've been raising sheep for eight years. Today, I'll walk you through every step of breeding and lambing and share some of our most valuable resources for these processes. So let's get started. First, let's talk through the timeline that we follow each breeding season. We start breeding in the fall, generally at the beginning of September. This aligns with the biological patterns of sheep who naturally breed as the days get shorter. Most of our ewes, or female sheep, will come into heat between September 1st and December 31st, making the fall season ideal for breeding in North America. The rams and ewes will stay together for about 51 days. This is the period where the actual breeding happens. I'll give you more details about this process in a few minutes but it's useful to establish the timeline of events before we get too deep into the details. After the breeding period, the pregnant ewes will spend 148 to 150 days, which is about five months, in the gestation period. This means our lambing season will begin in late February and can last until the end of April. We'll cover all of these steps throughout the course of this video, but for now, let's start back at the very beginning with the preparation for breeding season. We've raised Katahdin sheep for decades at Heifer Ranch because of their high resistance to parasites. Katahdins are hair sheep, which means that they don't produce wool and don't have to be sheared. Hair sheep are easier to manage in central Arkansas where temperatures get too high for wool sheep to thrive. At Heifer USA, we have a special connection with the Katahdin breed. Since Heifer International helped popularize the breed, along with Peel Farm, the original breeder in the late 20th century. Recently, we decided to introduce another breed of hair sheep to our flock by adding a Dorper Ram. By crossing two breeds of hair sheep, we're aiming to retain the best qualities of each breed to improve the genetic makeup of our flock. First, we need to assess the size and health of our flock. We'll start this process at the beginning of the breeding season, which for us starts in September. We have about 120 mature ewes who are available to be bred this season. Many of these ewes have been lambing for a few years and have proven themselves to be good moms by weaning strong lambs while keeping themselves healthy. So we want to keep them in our breeding flock. We will also introduce some of last season's replacement ewe lambs to our breeding flock. At this point, they are about seven months of age and can be bred for the first time. We want to select the strongest, healthiest lambs to become new moms. There are a few criteria we look for when adding new ewes to the breeding flock. First, the ewe lamb must be born as a twin or triplet, increasing the likelihood that she will bear multiple lambs. Next, she should already weigh 100 pounds or more. She should have a clear health history, proper body conformation, and a good body condition score, which we'll discuss later in this video. Finally, she should be well-behaved and easy to incorporate into our management system. We track these criteria in our detailed record templates, so keep watching to find out how you can get a free copy of these documents for your farm. We'll also take this opportunity to retire any ewes that have had trouble lambing or are no longer at their peak health or have displayed behavior issues. Once we've decided which ewes we will breed this season, we need to split the flock into their breeding groups based on which ram they will be exposed to. We currently have four rams, Jerry, Kramer, Chuck, and Norris. Jerry is a Dorper ram, while the other three are Katahdins. 
Each mature ram can service about 30 ewes per breeding season. If you have a yearling ram, you can expect him to successfully cover about 20 ewes. When designing our breeding groups, we try to create the best pairs possible and always avoid inbreeding. For example, Jerry is our shortest ram, so he will be paired with the shorter ewes, so he has a better chance of successfully breeding them. We also need to ensure that we have enough space for each ram and their breeding groups to have their own pasture. That means we'll need four separate pastures divided into smaller paddocks for rotational grazing that are relatively far from each other. If the breeding groups are too close together, the ewes may get distracted and the rams may get competitive, both of which could negatively impact your breeding results. If you have a vet that can perform a breeding soundness exam for the rams, schedule an appointment four to six weeks prior to breeding to look for any abnormalities that may affect breeding ability. Some vets can even evaluate semen for viability to ensure the ram will be productive. The rams used in breeding are crucial for the genetic makeup of your lamb crop. Consider the qualities you'd like to achieve with your flock and select a ram that displays desirable traits. Make any management changes as needed prior to introducing rams to breeding groups. With our breeding groups assigned, we will take the ewes to the corral and sort them into groups using a different section of the corral for each group. As we run the ewes through the corral, we will double check that they're all healthy for the start of breeding. We'll assess the ewes body condition score, feel her udders for any lumps, and check for signs of parasites. We'll also look for any limping or hoof issues that could cause issues during breeding or lambing season. We'll then walk each ewe group to their respective pastures where they'll await the introduction of their ram. We need to make sure that we're able to keep track of their progress throughout the breeding cycles. We'll need a way to see when each ewe has been mounted, meaning that the ram has made an attempt to breed her, because it allows us to estimate when that ewe will give birth. Luckily, there's a tool developed just for that purpose. We use a Premier One breeding harness and Easy Mark crayon for each of our rams. This harness straps onto the ram's chest and the large rectangular crayon clips into the slot. When the ram attempts to breed a ewe, the crayon will rub against her tail head, leaving a mark on her tail head as he dismounts. As we conduct pasture checks each day, we will bring our handy spreadsheet and binoculars with us and make notes of ewes that have received a colorful mark in the past day. The position and vibrance of the crayon mark give us additional information. A ewe with a faint mark positioned to one side was probably mounted coming into or out of heat, so she likely was not bred. Ideally, the U will be bred in standing heat, which makes a very bright crayon mark centered just above her tailhead. By collecting the dates of breeding for each U, we can accurately estimate the duration of our lambing season. We can use the sheep gestation calendar included in the Heifer USA Sheep Breeding Resource Guide to determine the approximate due dates of the first bred ewe and the last bred ewe, which will tell us how long we can expect lambing season to last. We can also utilize the color of the crayon to collect useful information about our breeding progress. We keep our rams and ewes together for three full heat cycles of 17 days, meaning ewes can potentially be bred multiple times during their exposure to the ram. We may replenish the crayons halfway through the heat cycle so the rams can continue marking ewes with vibrant, easy to see marks. Each ram will start out with a light colored marking crayon in their harness. After the first 17 day heat cycle, we will change out the crayon of the ram's marking harness for a darker color. We'll repeat this again at the end of the second heat cycle. The different colors of the crayon let us see whether a ewe was bred or rebred. We outfit our rams with their harnesses a few days prior to breeding to acclimate them to the feeling and to ensure a snug fit of the harness. At this time, we also administer CD and T vaccines to the rams, which we'll discuss more later in this video. Now that the rams have been outfitted with their harnesses and crayons, and the ewes are patiently waiting in their respective pastures, we will introduce each ram to his breeding group. We'll conduct daily checks to ensure the sheep have adequate forage, to see which ewes have been bred, and to update our records. 
Other than that, we'll let nature take its course until it's time to change the ram's marking crayons. About 95% of our use will be bred during the first heat cycle, but ideally we want every single ewe to become pregnant. So we allow for three heat cycles during breeding. We don't use any hormones to induce heat cycles in our ewes, so a long breeding season helps us organically reach the higher percentage of pregnancies. After two full heat cycles, we will combine our four ewe groups and leave one ram in the pasture with them. This cleanup ram's job is to use the third heat cycle to cover any ewes who have not yet been bred. The downside of a long breeding season is that you will have a long and labor-intensive lambing season. If you want a shorter lambing season, or if your forage can't sustain multiple ewe groups for that long, you can shorten your breeding season. If you choose this method, you can conduct pregnancy checks on your ewes to keep the pregnant ones and sell the open ones. This will also ensure that your lambs are very close in age. About 60 days after the rams are introduced for breeding, we will conduct ultrasounds to see which ewes are pregnant. This step isn't absolutely necessary, but it will allow us to call open ewes and estimate how many lambs we'll have this season. We also want to know how our replacement ewes are doing. We prefer them to have single lambs their first year for easy births. Some first-time ewes do have twins though, and we want to know ahead of time in case we need to assist them in delivery. With the help of Dr. David Powell, a veterinarian with experience in livestock ultrasounds, we'll run the ewes through the corral, catch each ewe in the squeeze chute, and scan them for pregnancy. We've found the easiest way to ultrasound the ewes is to use the squeeze chute to gently turn them onto their sides, which allows for easy access to their abdomen. If you don't have a squeeze chute, here's an easy alternative method. Choose an area that's elevated about two feet off the ground or the height of three pallets stacked on top of each other. Have one person hold the ewe steady while a second person conducts the ultrasound scan. During the ultrasound, we can see the developing lambs and their heartbeats. That means we can count how many lambs each ewe is carrying and ensure our flock of expecting mamas get the care and nutrition they need for successful lambing. This year, out of 120 ewes, 119 of them were confirmed pregnant. That's a 99% conception rate, which is typical for our operation. Our rams spend most of the year together away from the ewes and lambs, but when the rams are moved from their ewe groups after breeding, they will be covered in the scent of their ewes, which can intensify aggressive behaviors like headbutting and fighting. Rather than putting all the rams together immediately and risking major injuries, we will slowly reintroduce them to one another. This year, we place each ram in individual adjacent paddocks to allow them to re-familiarize themselves with each other through scent and interactions across a secure fence line. After one week, we paired the two dominant rams in one paddock with the other two rams in a shared paddock, once again making sure they share a fence line. After another week as neighbors, the rams get used to each other's scents and become less aggressive. Then we reunited the four rams peacefully with minimal fighting. It's important to keep an eye on the rams after breeding to make sure they are healthy and putting weight back on because their body conditions will suffer after a busy breeding season. Now let's turn our attention back to the ewe flock. With all our ewes reunited in one pasture, Rotational grazing becomes more manageable for our livestock team, and we can regularly check on our pregnant ewes. During the five months gestation period, there are a few ways that we ensure that all of our expecting moms are as healthy as possible. First, we make sure to provide adequate forage for all of our ewes through rotational grazing. Our sheep operation is 100% pasture-based, meaning that our ewes don't give birth in barns or stalls, we will select the best pasture we have available for lambing so that our ewes have 24-7 access to fresh, healthy forage. In addition to monitoring forage availability and ewe health conditions, 
We also need to vaccinate our ewes against clostridial diseases and tetanus with a C, D, and T shot. All of our sheep need to receive this vaccine to prevent diseases like black leg, botulism, and enterotoxemia. We administer C, D, and T shots to our ewes at least 30 days prior to lambing so that both the ewe and her lambs are covered by the vaccine. The only way a lamb receives the antibodies from this vaccine is through the adequate consumption of clostrum immediately after birth. While the ewes are in the corral for vaccinations, we will use this opportunity to trim hooves and conduct thorough health checks, including body condition scores, mouth checks, and FAMACHA scores. Body condition scoring is a method to assess the overall health of sheep by evaluating the amount of fat and muscle on their bodies. One is the lowest score, which corresponds to a sheep that is visibly too thin. And five is the highest score, which indicates that sheep is very overweight. Three is the ideal body condition score, but I will also keep sheep that are slightly underweight with a score of two. It's much easier to have a ewe gain weight and to raise her body condition score than to lose weight in a pasture-based operation. Next, we'll evaluate the condition of each ewe's teeth and gums. The gum should be a healthy pink color with no bleeding or swelling. On the teeth, we're looking for any signs of wear, breakage, or misalignment. Teeth should be smooth with no sharp edges. If a ewe has missing or broken adult teeth, she might have a hard time grazing and eating enough to support her lambs as they develop. Another danger to our ewe's nutrition is parasites, which we will monitor with the FAMACHA system. The FAMACHA system uses a color chart which is compared to the mucous membranes of the ewe's lower inner eyelid. This test is used to evaluate the ewe's level of anemia caused by Haemophagus contortus infection, commonly known as a barber pole worm, and it should only be conducted by a trained FAMACHA card holder. If you'd like to become certified in FAMACHA evaluation, we've included a link in the description of this video. On a scale of one to five, a dark red eyelid membrane color is a one and indicates no significant issues. A very pale or white eyelid receives a score of five and indicates severe parasite issues. Scores of one and two are considered healthy, while scores of three and four are concerning and require additional health monitoring through the five-point check system. Use at score five require chemical dewormers, which likely means we will call them from our breeding flock. If any ewes exhibit poor body conditions, broken teeth, or poor behavior, we'll use this opportunity to call them, since we want to maintain the healthiest flock possible. During the last month and a half before lambing begins, we will supplement the flock's forage with a feed mix of oats, dehydrated alfalfa, and corn chops to ensure the ewes are getting sufficient nutrition during the critical third trimester. Without this additional feed, the ewes could suffer a disease called pregnancy toxemia, which can be fatal for both the ewe and her unborn lambs. At the beginning of the third trimester, we provide half a pound of grain per ewe per day. From there, we'll gradually increase to a pound and a half of grain per ewe per day. In addition to our year-round free choice salt and mineral feeders, we offer free choice sodium bicarbonate, also known as baking soda, to prevent the ewes from experiencing acidosis as a result of consuming grain supplements. This final trimester is crucial for the growth and development of lambs, and it's the only time we provide additional feed for our sheep flock. The last thing we need to do to prepare ewes for lambing is to make them easily identifiable out on pasture. We will use long-lasting oil-based paint to brand each ewe with her ear tag number. We'll paint the number on both of her sides so that no matter which way she's facing, we can easily identify her number throughout the lambing season. This helps us maintain accurate records and ensure a successful season once lambing starts. If you're enjoying this video, please like it and subscribe to our channel for more opportunities in regenerative agriculture training. Up next, we're discussing all things lambing, what supplies we use, how we field process newborns, and how we maintain thorough records throughout lambing season. And, how you can improve your record keeping with a free resource from Heifer USA.
Long before your first lamb is born, you should gather all the necessary supplies for your lambing kit. I keep my supplies in a 50 gallon storage bin, which I take out to pasture with me. I'll also bring my shepherd's crook and an empty laundry hamper, which may seem a little crazy, but it's actually a huge help when field processing newborn lambs. If a ewe gives birth to twins or triplets, I'll put the siblings in this laundry hamper so I can field process and record data on one lamb at a time without the others wandering off with the ewe. We'll talk more about field processing lambs in a few minutes, but just know that it's certainly a two-handed job, so keeping all our lambs in one place is essential. The first and most important things we purchase each year are our ear tagging supplies. We special order our ear tags to fit our livestock numbering and organization system. We buy yellow tags for female lambs and orange tags for male lambs. And each ear tag displays four to five numbers. The first two digits correspond to the lamb's birth year, and the remaining two digits reflect when the lamb was born during the lambing season. We also have the AllFlex ear tag applicator and Super Lube antiseptic lubricant that makes ear tagging quick and easy. Make sure your ear tags and applicators are compatible. We have a pair of scissors to snip the lamb's umbilical cords, an iodine and a spray bottle to sterilize the area. We have a sling and digital scale to weigh the new lambs and our record binder to capture the birth weight, ear tag number, and other information about the lambs. We also use Sprayline Animal Safe spray paint to mark the lambs with their mom's ear tag numbers to help make sure that the ewes and lambs are paired correctly. We keep towels in our lambing kit to clean off and warm up any lambs that still have fluids on them. It's a good idea to keep sterile gloves in your lambing kit as well. Finally, we have our elastrator and castration bands for our male lambs. We'll show you exactly how to use this tool in a few minutes. In addition to the lambing kit that I bring out to the pasture, we also have lambing supplies that I keep in the office and are used for lambs with health issues. If a lamb has trouble nursing, we use a bottle fitted with a lamb nipple to feed either frozen or powdered colostrum, followed by lamb milk replacer. We have a stomach tube in case the lamb is struggling to eat or drink by itself. We keep energy drench on hand to give a boost to any lambs that are lethargic. Our goal as part of Grassroots Farmers Cooperative is to eliminate the use of antibiotics in raising our livestock especially those that will later be processed for meat. If we notice any health problems or deficiencies, we'll first administer animal aspirin, vitamin B, dextrose, calcium, or an anti-inflammatory medication when appropriate. We have needles and syringes available for those purposes. We have a lamb warming station in the office with a laundry basket and space heater to help raise the lamb's body temperature. We also keep a prolapse harness handy in case any ewes suffer prolapse after giving birth. And finally, we always keep our veterinarian's phone number on hand in case we have a lamb or ewe with a health concern that we aren't able to treat ourselves. We field process and collect data on our lambs within 24 hours of their birth. If we wait any longer, the lambs will be very difficult to catch. However, a few important things need to happen before we begin field processing a new lamb. First, we want the lamb to dry off so it's no longer covered in mucus. After giving birth, a ewe will typically lick her lambs to clean them off and begin that bonding process. We also want to see the lamb successfully nurse to make sure that it is paired with the correct ewe. If a ewe does not lick the lamb or let the lamb nurse, the lamb may be incorrectly paired or rejected by that ewe. Once we know which lambs belong to which ewe, it's time to start the field processing. We bring the lambing kit out to the pasture and place it near the lambing bed or the area where the ewe has given birth. This spot is marked with the scent of the new lambs, so it'll be the first place the ewe looks for her lambs. Bringing the lambing kit to this spot makes field processing far less stressful for the animals and ensures that the ewe stays close by to watch over her lambs. The first step of field processing is ear tagging. 
With the lamb held securely, either between my legs or by another person, I load the two parts of the ear tag into the applicator and apply a dab of antiseptic lubricant. Using my fingers, I position the tag between the two ridge lines that run down the lamb's ear and center it. Then I squeeze down quickly and firmly to pierce the ear and secure the tag in place. Next, we need to weigh our new lamb. First, we put the lamb into a sling with their front legs through the loop and the wide strap across their belly. Then we hook the sling's two straps to the bottom of the digital scale. We lift the lamb just off the ground, take the weight and gently lower her back down to remove her from the sling. We now look at the lamb's umbilical cord, which will naturally break during birth. We trim the umbilical cord with scissors so it's about two to three inches long, and then we treat it with iodine solution to prevent infection and create a protective barrier. If we're field processing a male lamb, we need to castrate him as soon as possible while there's less blood flow to the area and less pain for the lamb. With the lamb laying on his back, I load the small rubber band onto the four prongs of the elastrator tool. As I squeeze, the band opens wide enough for me to reach through and place his testicles through the band. I make sure both testicles are inside the band and both nipples are outside of it. When I stop squeezing the elastrator, the band tightens around the testicles, cuts off the blood supply, and causes the scrotum to wither and fall off within two weeks. The final step in our field processing routine is paint branding our lambs so we can easily match them to their mamas. Using Animal Safe Spray Line Paint, we paint the mom's ear tag number on both sides of the lamb's body. We use different colors of paint to designate whether the lamb was born as a single, twin, or triplet, maybe even a quadruplet. Since mom and the babies are paint branded, we can easily check that the ewe and lambs are paired correctly. If a lamb is born on a particularly cold, rainy, or snowy day, we will outfit it with a clear biodegradable rain jacket to keep the lamb dry and warm on pasture. When we've finished field processing our new lamb, it's time to return it to the ewe. A good mom will stay close by and repeatedly call for her lambs. Maiden ewes may run around frantically calling for their lambs. <coughs> to help the ewe quickly find her lamb, we will hold it at her eye level and slowly approach her. When she hears the lamb, I will gently place it on the ground using my hands to steady it. If we're field processing twins or triplets, we'll return all the lambs at once to the ewe. As I mentioned earlier, maintaining thorough and accurate lambing records is crucial for a sheep breeding operation. These records help us care for our new lambs, determine which lambs join our breeding flock, and decide which ewes are paired with each ram. These records also help us keep track of the health and behavior histories of each animal so we can strive for the healthiest flock possible. To help you maintain thorough records, We've included copies of the record templates we use here at Heifer USA in our Sheep Breeding Resource Guide, which we've linked in the description of this video. These templates include ewe and lamb profiles to record each animal's ear tag number, date of birth or purchase, health and treatment history, identifying characteristics, and more. We've also included our lambing record template which walks you through each step of field processing your newborns. Click the link in the description of this video to download a free copy of all of these resources and more. We keep a close eye on our flock to make sure that ewes are caring for their lambs by nursing. A good ewe will widen her stance and arch her back to make her teats more accessible to her lambs. Occasionally, a ewe will abandon or reject her lamb by ignoring it or headbutting the lamb away. There are many reasons for a ewe to reject a lamb, including, but not limited to, an unsuccessful bonding period, painful nursing for the ewe, 
a confused lamb following the wrong you, or a confused you kidnapping the wrong lamb, then abandoning it later. There are so many possibilities and we may not always solve the mystery, but we do need to meet the needs of our animals. Healthy, well-fed lambs will stretch when they stand, then run and play with other lambs or follow their moms around the pasture. If we see a lamb constantly calling for her you with no response, it's possible that she was rejected. A lamb with a hollow or sunken belly probably hasn't eaten because it hasn't been allowed to nurse. If a lamb gets up, walks a short distance, and then lays back down, it's likely weak and malnourished. These abandoned lambs need extra care from us, including bottle feeding to provide sufficient colostrum within six to 12 hours of birth. Colostrum is the nutrient-rich milk that ewes produce just after lambing, and it's crucial to the lamb's ability to fight infection. So if we see a lamb that's rejected or otherwise unable to nurse, we need to intervene. Here at Heifer USA, abandoned lambs become bottle babies, meaning a livestock team member will bottle feed them three times a day until they are strong and healthy enough to be sold to other local farmers. This job is labor intensive, but it helps us achieve a low mortality rate and a higher return on the time and care we've invested in our flock. The most common cause of death in newborn lambs is hypothermia and starvation, which often appear together. Spotting a lamb that is just starting to suffer from hypothermia or starvation is a key skill. Things to watch for include a hunched posture, hollowed out sides, excessive calling, lethargy, and dehydration. In many cases where hypothermia and starvation are in its early stages, all that's required is to make sure that the lamb gets a good suckle from the ewe. Any lamb that is unresponsive or lying flat out on its side requires immediate attention. Perhaps the best way to learn to recognize a chilled lamb is to watch the behavior of other lambs that are doing well. There's an indescribable look to a well-fed and happy lamb. And once you know it, you will have little trouble spotting the ones that lack it. There are also two techniques that will help save the lamb. The first is feeding colostrum and lamb milk replacer by stomach tube. The second technique is administering dextrose by intraperitoneal injection. To make sure you're administering the right amount of dextrose, we've included a dextrose dosage information sheet in our sheep breeding resource guide. As the lambs continue to grow, we watch both lambs and ewes for signs of illnesses. Our main concern for ewes is mastitis, an inflammation of the mammary gland that makes nursing difficult and painful for the ewe. If a ewe is experiencing mastitis, she will have a fever. Her udder will be hard, red, and hot to the touch. She may refuse to eat, and she probably will not allow her lambs to nurse. Her milk may be stringy and clumpy or could contain some blood. Since these are breeding ewes and they will not be processed for meat, we can treat mastitis with antibiotics. For other serious illnesses in lambs or ewes, contact your veterinarian for expert advice. Throughout lambing season, we continue to utilize rotational grazing to provide nutrient-rich forage for our newly expanded flock. In addition to our 120 ewes, we now have more than 200 lambs. Over the next eight to nine months, we need to regularly move the flock to prevent overgrazing in our pastures and move them away from parasitic opportunities. We will regularly monitor our lambs for parasites, conduct health checks, administer CD and T vaccinations, and watch as they grow to an ideal weight of 120 pounds. At that point, it's time to send the lambs to be processed. As this year's lambs grow, we're creating a step-by-step -step video guide for raising lambs on pasture with information on stocking rates, rotational grazing, livestock guardian dogs, winter management, and more. Subscribe to our channel so you don't miss it.
Because Heifer USA is a member of Grassroots Farmers Cooperative, we sell our lambs directly to the co-op. We receive payment based on the total hanging weight of our lambs. Then Grassroots sells and delivers individual cuts of lamb to customers through their e-commerce site. If you're not a member of a farmer's cooperative, there are still many ways to make a profit with your lambs. You could sell weaned lambs to other farmers for breeding through livestock auction or personal networks. You could sell full lamb carcasses to a processor or butcher. You could sell individual cuts of lamb like shoulders and racks at farmer's markets, in local stores, or at your own farm stand. Of course, be mindful to follow all meat inspection and sale regulations in your area. With a wide variety of sale methods and markets, it may be difficult to predict your profits from sheep breeding. However, we'll show you exactly how much money we made in gross sales from one cycle of sheep breeding. First, let's account for the called ewes and bottle lambs we sold to other farmers. In one season, we sold 14 open ewes to a local sale barn for $155 each, three bred ewes to a local first-time sheep farmer for $170 each, 18 bottle lambs to local farmers for $50 each, bringing our live sale payout to $3,580. Before we look at the revenue from the lambs we sent to processing, we need to understand the difference between live weight and hanging weight or carcass weight. When we send our sheep to processing, they should weigh between 100 and 125 pounds. When they arrive at the processor, they will weigh slightly less since their rumens or stomach chambers are no longer full of forage and water. The lamb will weigh even less after it's processed and its carcass is hung to be weighed. The carcass weight of our lambs is typically between 45 and 55 pounds. We sell our lambs to be processed in two groups, one in October and one in November to allow all the lambs to reach their goal weight. With 66 lambs processed in October and 62 in November, the total carcass weight of our lamb flock came to 6,377.5 pounds for a total payout of $23,641.40 from processing. Altogether, in one cycle of sheep breeding, we made $27,221.40. After selling this year's lambs, we're left with 120 of our best ewes and replacement ewes so we can start the cycle over for our next lambing season. Breeding sheep can be a long, occasionally labor-intensive process, but it can yield significant profit for small-scale farmers. To make it as easy as possible to plan, execute, and profit from a successful breeding season, we've created the Heifer USA Sheep Breeding Resource Guide. With an annual management calendar, lambing records, you and lamb profiles, this document will keep you organized for many breeding seasons to come. Claim your free copy at the link in the description and let us know you enjoyed this training by liking this video and subscribing to our channel. Thanks for watching. Keep learning with Heifer USA with on the ground lambing season advice from Christine, or learn the basics of raising sheep on pasture with this video.